the structure is how um, the organization is arranged to guide interactions and the patterns that emerge from it. And then the operations are the methodology for getting things done. Um, so those are the main the four main categories, but we will start with identity and then Barrett will give um, an overview of that and the subcomponents within it. Um, and then we'll kind of collect your sticky notes on on your thoughts of, you know, whether these are the right ones, what are we missing, what should we include um, in order to kind of have like a more comprehensive view of each of these. So yeah, Barrett, when you're ready, you can you can kick us off. Yeah, let's let's get going and don't be shy putting in sticky notes as we speak. Uh, we have not put down definitions of the various terms. We're just going to do some storytelling to guide you through because with purpose, we want this to be very open and we want you to to add ideas, identify gaps. So when we start with identity, <clears throat> that's that's obviously like a headline and it it constitutes the various parts that you can see here underneath like the narrative and the paradigm and the purpose and we believe that identity reflects the culture of an organization identity is what represents the organization within its internal ecosystem and we do understand if we took the perspective of the outside ecosystem of an organization, that might well be called the brand of that company or organization. So identity is our is our term here. We 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 take a aspirational perspective here, but we we will not miss provoking you every once in a while. So if we look, for example, what is the the narrative of a company? We understand that the narrative is, is a living element. The story that an organization writes every day is a living, adaptive story. It's a narrative. Look look at me, for example. I'm, I'm German, and I remember very well companies that came out of the, the Second World War, for example, ThyssenKrupp, and they were producing, uh, with all their metals, they were producing tanks and panzers. So... Imagine how that company's narrative will have evolved over time, right? So there, there is a big story to be told for any company out there, but maybe that's a very provocative example. Uh, so that's all about the living narrative as it evolves, just as a company evolves. The paradigm, that's a little bit an abstract term, but the paradigm is the worldview of the organization that we're looking at. It's all its foundational assumptions, the ideas, the structure. Uh, think of think of the old industrial paradigm um, of the organization as a machine, as the organization as as a dictatorial system of command and control. That's obviously not the the aspirational perspective that we are taking here. But, but take that example. Think of something like Charlie Chaplin in the movie, I think it was Modern Times, when he's sitting there at the factory floor doing his things. That is the old paradigm. So we are clearly asking here, what is that new paradigm? How much of industrial paradigm does it still reflect? In which direction is it going? Uh, we also do not have the answers for that, but we clearly say that paradigm looking forward should clearly be a different one than than the one that we have today. And we get a hint how that paradigm might look like and the worldviews we might collectively have if we look at the values of an organization. What, what are these values? What are these principles that people follow again on a day-to-day -day basis? So how do they relate to that organization? What are these values? And, and we sort of get an idea they follow values but what are these and how could they be expressed? It's It still sounds very abstract. And the, the last point here is purpose. So I, I, I guess everybody has heard about the vision and the mission statements that companies have. And you, you might have tackled these actually like in a startup competition or, or something like that. So what is vision, mission? And then again, what is the purpose then? And how can the purpose drive the identity of a company? And is it a living one? We believe it is an evolving purpose 
of an organization as it shapes up. It, it sort of tries to answer, who are we as an organization? What is our North Star? What is the impact that we desire to have in the world? Which functions do we perform out there in the world? And how do we relate to our ecosystem out there? It th There is one purpose which, which comes to mind, which, which I sort of like. I don't really like the company. I don't identify with it. You might. I'm, I'm talking of Harley Davidson, the one of, of the motorcycles. And I learned out of the books that their purpose is actually giving people freedom. And I think that's an inspirational, very interesting purpose to look at and then to realize, yeah, it's still Harley Davidson, right? The company about the motorbikes. And if I think of freedom, then I might also say, hey, that doesn't relate to how these motorcycles are actually fed, what sort of energy they're using and how noisy they might possibly be. So the purpose is freedom, it has nothing to do with, with, uh, with these motorbikes uh, as such. So that's inspirational. So I leave it as that. I gave you lots of ideas and a few provocations. We we would very much like you to, to add sticky notes against the ones that we have put here and see what we have missed out. So for example, yeah. the, the culture one, we believe that's like everywhere across the identity sphere here. It's hard to it's hard it's hard to make it tangible, but clearly we take culture as being a fundamental element of the identity of a company. So please please add more. Uh, how much time should we put off the clock for this one? I haven't I haven't paid attention to time. <laughs> I'm of that paradigm. <laughs> I'm, I'm of that paradigm of the man, right? The paradigm of the man says you cannot do two things at the same time. Yeah. I think we can put around like six minutes for the <laughs> with three minutes. Oh yeah. Um I guess including discussion. Uh Six minutes in total. Um, assuming we are not shy, the the person who wrote about the the slogan, the culture and the subcultures and the history, maybe you would like to explain that just to get our creative juices floating here. Just just unmute, speak up. It's fine. Hello. Yeah, I wrote this um this uh post it. Mm -hmm. Um well it's uh, it's just uh ideas that, that came came to my mind uh, uh regarding this uh this uh, theme of uh, identity slogan is uh is a, a quick um, catchy uh, phrase that 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 stick to uh try to to encompass the 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 mission of uh or the the personality of the organization as well so some have some don't um so i thought it was a kind of a way to to uh put in practice uh, not the values not the purpose but but a bit of everything <laughs> a bit of everything yeah i got another one i love to do trail running and my favorite shoes, for example, they claim, they make a slogan which goes like, fly, human, fly. And yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's that's as aspirational as Harley Davidson comes along. 
which actually they use that purpose in their advertisements. So I I, I like your stickies. I, I they resonate very well, and um, I think we could we could move them around because you you're clearly making the point of where the company is coming from, the hist the history point of view, the evolution of it, that they actually translate the purpose or the vision mission statement into a slogan which they actively use as part of their marketing strategy not everybody does it but many do it right i i will always question and want to look behind and say is that so i mean that does that really resonate i mean obviously it does but do they actually live according to this maxim that i've put out there that to me is always a big question and that's also part of the culture again uh leadership style is uh, one that we didn't pick up on too much someone want to speak about that 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 was mine uh i think uh, i think what i what i'm meaning there is that there is as you know like very different leadership styles you have the dictator you have the one who uh, inspires who is a visionary um, and I think depending on what how the leadership looks in an organization their identity uh, becomes very differently I think you can see it also in the same company over years switching the leadership so I believe that to be a very important part of the identity of a company and does that fit maybe within values or is it a separate category to you? Mm. Andreas, do you think that might go under values or do you think it's a separate? separate um, yeah, I, I think it goes with the, yeah, maybe the values or a separate one. I was also thinking about how it, if it is a, you know, like, an, an innovative organization in, in its DNA, uh, or if it's more, um, how do I say, a maintaining, I don't know the exact word, but who, who keeps things uh, and the legacy of, of, of what there already is, more traditional. Uh, but I don't know where you want to put that. Um, so so that I, th I think you, you could do it. <laughs> Move it around. Okay. I would argue maybe it's a it's a bit different. Uh, it's it's it has to be in line with the the values, but it's different as well because it's kind of the personality of the 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 leading uh, uh, people uh, within the uh, the organization, and they they have to lead in a way that uh, fits with the the value shared by the people, but at the same time, uh, someone maybe more uh, process oriented or other another one maybe more a visionary uh, leader or um, so so. It, it influences the 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 identity of the 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 organization, but is uh, is different as well from the values, I think. Mm -hmm. And we identified that there is a certain diversity to it because we 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 took note here of the subcultures. So if we are talking of a bigger organization, if they have an innovation lab of sorts, the culture in there might tick very differently and the leadership style might be very different from, let's say, headquarters. Uh, I would actually, uh, I think what you're saying is really interesting, but I, I would also put it mm -hmm. in another perspective that uh, the, the leadership style or mentality is also what um, sort of decides if an innovation lab would even be able to uh, live within an organization because uh, with with um, if the right mindset isn't there um how to say the, there is no new stream of oxygen in the water so the fish will die right so if you have the little pond in the middle and it's uh, a very conservative um leadership within the organization the innovation lab will will self die Yes, it all starts there. Okay, I think so, we so... heard we heard the time. I think we need to wrap up the first stream of work, if that's fine, and we move on to our purple bubbles, all about strategy.
yeah and we look we look at the time here again so again strategy as the overarching term for basically how we translate more of the purpose vision mission statement abstract work into concrete work and how we plan that looking ahead so how do we translate these more difficult items we just mentioned into strategic work that we can translate into plans business plans tactics things that then go into daily work in the old-fashioned way strategy was let me exaggerate again it's like just just to carry that point home okay it 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 used to be done like now in december it was done once and then in, in January, we start implementing it and we follow that strategy. And then in 12 months from here, we're going to review it. Well, that can't really be it. And many IT companies seem to follow that worldview still because they look at their live dashboards and they believe that that is strategy. So that's what the point we are making in our aspirational perspective is strategy is adaptive. Strategy lives on. Strategy is about the ways that we create value, we deliver value, we capture that value over time. And that needs to follow an adaptive path. It's not a linear path, it's a non-linear path. So we have, we take guidance from that work stream that we just analyzed. We take guidance from principles and values and we translate that into, into daily work. So we have value streams, the way we, we deliver and create that value, but the people working with us and for us and in the broader ecosystem, they need to be aligned. So this needs to make sense. And how do we make sense of that strategy? So that's the alignment bubble, the value stream bubble, adaptive strategy we mentioned. In strategy, though, there is an element of looking at time horizons. I guess it, it's one of these popular tools, the, the three horizon model, but it clearly also means we, we have a strategy in place, how we want to tackle everyday business, looking into the next year, into a midterm horizon, maybe looking into the next two, three years, and there needs to be a strategy in place, that a vision that looks into where are we as an organization in 10 years from now? How is that going to look like? Who will be our customers? How will we shift? Um, so yeah, please put sticky notes. Tell us if we're missing something um, or simply translate what you might have written before and think how that would evolve in that strategy stream that we have drawn here. Or maybe you can think of an example of a, of a great organization out there where you saw, ah, that, that's interesting. They are really aspirational. They are doing it really right. Okay, we're getting some feedback loops here. I, I see the one on having shared goals. That, that one clearly seems to come from the identity conversation, right? Coming from a shared purpose and then translating that as we align the strategy into work packages, into having shared goals. Do, do I get this right? That would, would the person like to comment on that? Yeah, um, it was just me. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. That one of the challenges we face is you have a broad mission and then you have different teams 
who are going for their respective team goals. But to tie it all up, I think we always need for people to really to collaborate across teams for them to really have the shared goals. So I think it is a step mm -hmm. that comes in between the identity and how do you actually operationalize the alignment in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, does does the next sticky there hint at that idea, the incentivizing innovative and transformative interventions? That could be one of the ways of actually doing that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where you reward this kind of behavior that promotes collaboration. And I think that's one of just one of the hardest things. Yeah, sometimes we find it difficult to do within a larger organization which has a certain level of inertia in which you know, we need to kind of get over that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I move a little bit to the right of the big strategy box because I can see more stickies appearing there. Positive feedback loops around adaptive strategy and future forecasting. Reflective learning and having time for that. Uh, visualizing strategy. How do we do that? <laughs> um... I put one there as well. I, I think something I've learned uh, of experience, um, I mean, as simple as if you kick off a new project, the aspects of visualizing what we are doing and uh, to yeah, so you have a, a common framework. Uh, an example of that, I think you give very good examples. So say, for example, that I say a cup of coffee, um, I, I guess it, that cup will look different for every one of us so what does our common cup look like so by visualizing what you talk about you create a much more aligned uh, vision of what, where you are going and how you're going to go there mm -hmm. it's it's part of our principles i think within within systems innovation do mm -hmm. you have do you have an example a concrete example what could be used to visualize strategy um, definitely. And, and, and for whom um, I, I think uh, a, a good way of doing it is of course using just illustration photo uh, AI uh, anything that um, how to say uh, makes words come to life uh, yeah, it'd also be interesting to do like text analysis on what people talk about in the boardroom and just see what words pop out as the biggest words. Do you hear lots of words around control and prediction and uh, planning, or do you hear lots of words around emergence and you know un mm. unintended consequences and so forth? Because I, I think it's always really interesting to do it rever reversed. So say, for example, one thing I could do if it's a morning meeting is ask everyone to close their eyes and think about a cup of coffee and then ask everyone, so what does your cup look like? And the point of it is that everyone looks different. So what is our common cup going to look like? Is it blue? Is it dark coffee? Is it? So I, I think that's what you need to do also with, with strategy in many ways, because words are very abstract and uh, they can mean a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. basically yeah i was uh, i was expecting you would you would suggest for example something like share share a business model canvas mm. or any other tool that that shows the strategy on on one or two pages mm. um I, I think that's good but i think a business model canvas is good for for people who are how to say uh what who knows what it is not everyone does within a company and that's where mm -hmm. i think that visualization is um and for example manipulative images uh something a photo a strategy 
uh, using AI if you're talking about the future and, and what things might look like, but that you just have uh, something that stimulates the, the visual 50% of the brain, basically, uh, because it's usually much easier for everyone to uh, remember. Mm -hmm. And the more realistic it is, the, the easier, how to say, the, the less in, interpretations you put into it. Yeah, right. Thank you for that. And just as a last word, when working with companies, and I'm using the business model canvas as one of the prime tools, you wouldn't you wouldn't think that they cannot even agree on that canvas mm. just as a feedback, right? It has zero visualization. It's just nine boxes. Mm. Um, just just to say that as well, mm. not to demotivate us. I still believe in visualizing that is a great idea. Mm. Uh, I, I can add one thing to that. I think you are mm -hmm. right. When, when If we go back to the identity, there is a, a three-hour workshop about brands where you do a bit the same. How, how do you see yourself? And you can use different examples of traditional and really for, forward-going companies and so on. And then you make the people in the room um, sort of put the one to 10 on the different um, questions and you get really really different answers but really really good conversations uh, yeah so the richness is in that conversation yeah yeah nice um let's move on sanjana i think you want to go towards green before color and structure uh, before we move on quickly do we want to um have uh, Jules explain her thought. I I didn't grasp what you suggested. Uh, there's a message uh, in the chat. Uh, so uh, I added to the board here, like Jules. Uh, do you want to speak about it, or I can read it? So a legacy holder to keep the base purpose and mission in focus and adapt to the present and future position and potential outcomes. Um, so that was the note Jules added. I'm not sure Jules is with us. Maybe you want to move on. Okay. Okay, so moving on to structure so what we have here um for subcomponents is so thinking of it as um kind of a circle structure rather than a pyramid um and circle organizations teams self-organize um and kind of form in response to certain needs or functions they can be nested they can adapt combine dis uh, disband as appropriate um and they ensure that everyone has a voice so it's a more adaptable and participatory way of functioning that um isn't you know structured so like kind of rigidly hierarchical and is able to better involve people and adapt to changing organizational needs um platform so an organization acting as a platform provides infrastructures and resources for people essentially to take those, mix, match, create, um, kind of do what's needed in order to, um, you know, meet the situation at hand. So this kind of adds an element of agency and modularity, um, easing the flow of collaboration. Um, so this is, you know, removing any barriers or incentives that might work against that. I think someone mentioned in the identity section above too, right? Like if maybe if like the intention or values for a certain initiative aren't there at that level, right? If they're very kind of like rigid and it's not like a, you know, kind of safe to fail or psychologically safe space, right? And they want to set up something around innovation, it's likely not going to work. <laughs> Even if, you know, leadership or something says it, there's, you know, in the background, all these like latent signals and cultures and, you know, kind of consequences. So you want to make sure that, with whatever, you know, structure, strategy, identity, like all of these things are aligned and consistent. Um, so it isn't, you know, unintentionally blocking, you know, something like collaboration or the goals that um, you actually want to move forward to. And then 
Lastly here, uh, we have ecosystem. So it's kind of thinking of the boundary of an organization as more fluid. So then they can like regularly, more regularly kind of partner with, you know, ecosystem partners, users, uh, suppliers, et cetera. Um, so it's kind of in a way to say, um, can make them more involved in the process or even, you know, part of certain um, circles temporarily over a longer period of time since these different groups in the ecosystem um, are going to be involved or impacted with, you know, organizational outputs anyways, it's good to, you know, kind of involve them and their voice um, and their perspective to, to begin with. So that's kind of an overview of what we had for the different, you know, elements of structure here, but yeah, I'll keep an eye out, see you guys populating notes and different feedback. someone want to speak to iteration, coaching leadership? That was me again. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, I think, um, I think that, that iteration is so important and tend to be forget in a very linear process of achieving. Um, so to dare to to do and redo uh, and have that mindset uh, is really important that nothing is going to get perfect or as we spoke about about the adaptive organization that you can you can't control the forces around you so the process actually has is necessary to be iterative because you have to rework things all the time coaching leadership is uh, to have a leadership uh, where you aren't a specialist or going with too much uh, opinions, but instead make sure to coach the team of specialists and give them the assets they need to be able to perform uh, and deliver on the challenges they are, um, how to say, get, get, are supposed to work on, basically. It's more of like an enabling function, right? It's exactly. like rather than, you know, directing, telling them what to do, noticing yeah. kind of what they need and setting them up with the support for them to be able to develop or do what they need to. Yep. I think I heard a podcast with a politician not so long ago, and he said that I think there is a problem today with politics and it's being very populistic and almost run as commercial companies. Because when, when I was active, I tried to always see myself in the role that taking in information from people who were very skilled and good in their specialties and to then out of that take decisions, not having opinions. Mm -hmm. um, and I, Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit like that within companies as well. It's much more motivating to have uh, that sort of leadership to work. Right. Yeah. And you're also probably able to make better decisions and more timely decisions, right? If you're enabling the people who are closest to the work and kind of have that expertise and background and, you know, that's what they're involved with. You're giving them, you know, the ability to make the right decisions rather than kind of assuming when you're kind of separated, yeah. you know, <laughs> several spaces from, from the and actual you, situation. Yeah. And you grow within yourself as a leader as well, because you yep. gain knowledge from listening to the people you are leading. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Get context. Thank you. And then someone want to speak to the decision-making processes? Sure. I'm just finding the mute button. You can hear me now, right? Um, so the decision-making processes is something that we mm -hmm. struggle with as an adaptive organization focused on system change. And it comes from the tension between trying to give people agency to take the right decisions at the right time mm -hmm. versus the need for organizational kind of safety check um, processes. So like 
can you use a new IT system isn't as simple as can you afford it. It also includes like does it talk to other IT systems and what's has it been implemented properly with our GDPR data tracking systems and stuff like this. So um, I think the that those processes for uh, leaving people feeling like they're empowered to take a decision while also mm -hmm. aligning with other people that are important stakeholders is, is uh, tricky to do when you take away the pyramid because people are quite used to going up across and down yeah. again um so that's yeah that's true when um kind of the agency is more distributed right i feel like there's probably need to be other things in place that connect people to like you said if you're making a decision around an it system probably you know finance needs to be involved or you know the main users of the it system and it's yeah it's a way to be able to make sure that you're kind of connecting everyone that who the decision affects so you're not really missing <laughs> something right or kind of making a costly mistake yeah yeah it's a consultation process which happens organically in hierarchical organizations through the right. committees uh, but is doesn't come naturally to people so you have to establish a quite tight process to right. enable that yeah that's interesting. And then, yeah, there's also the trade-off of time, right? Like in terms of getting <laughs> that coordination, getting everyone on board, getting consensus, you know, on certain things as well. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I wonder if there's, you know, yeah, there. I think with a push to de decentralization that we kind of hear more and more when people talk about structure, right? There also needs to be, I feel like sometimes there's, you know, people want to go all the way, you know, to one side of the pendulum, right? The opposite of like, you know, complete control, but there also needs to be some sort of like alignment, you know, or balance. Um, yep. Awesome. Okay. Let's see what else. Uh, there's a um, question, question there from Maka. Do you ask? Okay. Yes. I'm opening the chat. Maka, do you want to, do you want to ask your question? Are the green bits related to resources? Yes. Um, oh, like just in terms of the colors on the board? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, I, I just wonder, I'm very used to theories of change and logic models. And normally, you know, you have a section where you state, uh, you know, everything that is needed to run the business. So all resources, mm -hmm. staff, uh, you know, like uh, financial resources, material resources. And I was mm -hmm. wondering, if the green beads uh, in the model may be related to that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. We, um, honestly, we just had different colors for the different <laughs> sections to separate this out. But I think structure out of all these categories is probably the one that's closest related to it. I think the goal of this model is not to say this is what organizations need to have because each organization is going to look different, right? But it's kind of taking the perspective of you know, when you create an organization, what are the different elements you need to think about? But I think, yeah, you bring up a good point. It probably is closest, more closely related to structure um, in terms of like, you know, what, what are you providing for people? How are things kind of laid out? Um, but that might be a good thing for us to also include in our model is just, you know, if this is kind of more like operationally kind of how you're looking at like a org model or org design, what are the resources that also need to be involved? Is that kind of what you were getting at? Yeah, yeah. It, you know, normally um, when you have um, a logic model, you know, the structural elements, so those resources are the ones that enable the implementation of activities. So if you have an organization and you don't have enough staff, for example, that is going to affect, uh, you know, the ability to get the work done and your ability to, you know, then uh, be able to achieve your uh, objectives, the strategic objectives. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, uh, you know, like that, that's uh, kind of the, the link between the, the things mm -hmm. in my mind. Yep. That's a great point. Thanks for sharing. Okay, so this so will move on to, or does anyone else have anything to say um, for structure that you know they wanted to, to share before we we go on to our last um, category? Yeah, I, heard, I think we're sorting for a kind of recap or uh, an overview of it all again. To, uh, uh, structural, I could I could help with that if you want. Um, quickly, you want to zoom out a little bit. Uh, do we want to do that after we go to operations Good or? Day. Yep, as you wish. Okay, perfect. 
Okay, great. So here for operations, um, kind of, you know, the method methodology or mindset for, you know, how things actually get done in an organization. Here we have, you know, human centered, so constantly going back to people's experiences and, you know, as they evolve over time as well to make sure what you're doing is actually, you know, providing value or meeting a certain need. Um, we have uh, agile, so using elements of agile methodology, such as um, sprints, iteration, you know, feedback loops, all that to make sure that, um, again, you're kind of taking in feedback and you're building on progress and not necessarily <laughs> planning for something in like a huge chunk. And then, you know, you realize like, you know, halfway through all oh, this might not actually be something that we need to address, address and we should have, you know, adjusted course, you know, way before. Um, plug and play is around, um, you know, modularity and kind of being able to immediately use or kind of couple resources to be able to kind of piece and build together for delivery. Um, and service oriented are kind of providing solutions through connected services um, and kind of having that infrastructure that is kind of reusable, easy to access. So you're able to kind of provide um, what the user kind of needs on demand. Okay, so then this is what we have for operations, which is our last category in this model. So feel free to go ahead and you know pop populate any sticky notes for your thoughts of what we have on here, what we've missed, um, and any, any other feedback you might have. Okay, while people are populating, I see a question in the chat to state again, kind of what the, the purpose of the model is. So basically we're trying to think of organizations more as a, you know, system rather than, um, you know, maybe like kind of like a machine or kind of industrial mentality that you kind of see more common um, associated with it. So we've kind of created these different, um, you know, categories of kind of organizational functioning and thinking kind of how, you know, they link together um, in order to kind of create this aspirational model. So if you want an organization to kind of, I mean, we, we kind of live in, a, you know, complex world anyway. So in order to actually, you know, kind of take sight of that and kind of apply a systems thinking perspective, how would kind of an organization go about these different categories? So trying to create different subcomponents about them, the kind of characteristics that are kind of comprehensive um, and kind of inclusive of the different things to consider. Let me know if that that was helpful, Gerard. Yes, thank you. Um... I was just curious because many people uh, then posted things about uh, different solutions, like for example, multidisciplinary teams or uh, other things, and I it immediately raised the questions. Uh, the question to me: um, If it's a model, then why do I think in solutions? Is it more? Mm -hmm. Is it a diagnostic tool or not? Or is it a collection of possibilities? Because I mean. Okay, multidisciplinary teams, it's like something who would argue against this in in, in our current uh, situation. Uh, but then again, I could also say there is another possibility. So um, looking at a detail like this, I, I just questioned what, what the use of it is in the end. Uh, what do you aim to do with it? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, I think the purpose is trying to... Mm -hmm. Get a holistic view of how these different parts we talk about in organizations might fit together as an integrated system. Um, we often, yeah, we talk about these things, but we don't actually have a way of kind of connecting them in some sense. Um, so it's the idea that a, a model of a system is supposed to apply to all systems. Well, shouldn't it apply to an organization? And shouldn't it be able to give us a way of bringing different parts together and see how they fit together? Um, in a kind of holistic view. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, 
and then the sticky you refer to may not really be relevant or that may be an outcome of this type of system right instead of kind of part of it yep. and then also kind of after after we kind of consolidate um you know feedback and release this what's actually the next step in our toolkit after this is more around um, change strategies, change change strategies and methods within each of these areas, um, in order to actually see like how can you you know adjust organizations to kind of think in this way or kind of create organizations in this way, um, like both initiating and sustaining change. So that's kind of <laughs> where it's going in from in terms of like the larger picture. But yeah, this is right now it's kind of similar to what Joss said in terms of kind of reframing how to think of organizations because you might need, you know, a different model or a different future state in order to actually think about how to go about change or like, you know, something to aim for in general um, in the first place. And then, you know, we're going to follow that up for with um, actual like methodologies to um, kind of initiate and sustain that. Okay, so, so here. Um, does someone want to talk about sticky end user first? If you're shy, it's fine. <laughs> so I wanted to call that out. We can move on to see what else is here. Yep. Alignment to strategy, alignment to value. Yep. This is kind of like the connectivity that we were talking about before in terms of even though we've <laughs> created these different categories, they are, you know, interconnected and influence each other. And there should be, you know, kind of alignment throughout for it to, you know, operate um, as a fully functioning system. Okay. Does anyone want to talk about risk appetite? Mm. Hello. <clears throat> that was me. Um, I see a close connection between <clears throat> agile projects as a methodology for delivery but deciding mm -hmm. what to deliver and how ambitious to be is a, mm -hmm. a risk appetite thing and i see them as quite distinct um mm -hmm. aspects and the how an organization goes about taking just to decide uh taking the decision to take a risk how big mm -hmm. that risk is how fast to move it's an important element of uh, being innovative i think yeah uh, that's that's a great component of it as well that um yeah i think we could either add as a category or connect to like you said like agile when it's <laughs> when when you're thinking about like it's also good to ask questions like what are you innovating on like to what end right what what is kind of within the boundary of like acceptable risk and that might be you know a hard boundary to draw or something that's moving or will be you know different at different stages or for different teams yeah yeah and i think um that also connects back quite closely to something I put under identity, which was the organization's permission to exist. Mm -hmm. So most most organizations have permission from some other organization to exist. And they have certain paradigms and rules that control the risk taking behavior in all the other organizations. So a financial regulator controls the existence of banks and a charity regulator controls the existence of charities and donors, mm -hmm. you know, there's so there's this is part of uh, how adaptive an organization can really be is uh, quite strongly influenced by those. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. It's kind of limits the kind of autonomy, right? <laughs> to, to work in a certain way when, when you have that. Yeah, thank you. We just see Audrey yeah. has her hand up. Uh, I guess I wanted to speak to the end user um, mm -hmm. sticky. So, um, so I work for a large federal agency here in the U.S., and mm -hmm. we um, deal with uh, beneficiaries of Medicare plans, and uh, we're, you know, we're appeals office. And one of the things that I think, hit, you know, is something that I'm concerned about, and I've mentioned to management, et cetera, and my teams, is that, you know, the process of um, adjudicating these appeals is like complete mud to a lot of our end users mm -hmm. and uh, we're looking for ways to become more responsive to our stakeholders the real stakeholders who are the beneficiaries in in this matter who are usually people who are older um, mm -hmm. and have a wide variety of backgrounds 
uh, you know, where what we are as an agency, they come, they appeal, and they have no idea how, um, you know, anything about the process or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one of the challenges in 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 developing value um, to the taxpayer and the people who are actually funding this. <laughs> we, you know, it's it's sometimes the procedures uh, get in the way of, um, you know, of actually helping the, um, the, the recipient of the services. So, uh, finding other ways to one, stay within the realm of legal due process, but at the same time, be more responsive to the people who are part of the, the, the end users who are part of that process and without, you know, um, you know, and, and without having any kind of conflict with, um, ex parte communications and so on, because we're supposed to be fair and, and, and balanced and we're making all of these decisions, but yet the people who are filing these appeals are people who don't have access to the law, don't have access to resources. So how do we do that in a way that's fair and also, you know, enables them to empowers them to be able to do this in a way that will benefit their cause as well as, you know, provide us with the opportunity to help them, stuff like that. So that's what I want to speak to, to um, end user, um, end user first. I think in a lot of large organizations, we forget who we are serving. And that's my comment, my two cents. Thank you. Yeah, and that's that's a great point, right? Where it's <laughs> a lot of the processes or systems or mindsets you've set up actually gets in the way of like your purpose, you know, in the first place. And like you said, when there's like maybe legal or financial boundaries, it's important to realize where can you have flexibility, right? Maybe some parts right. kind of right you need to right. adhere to, but what around that is like movable and adaptable for to actually yeah. serve people properly. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Of course. So I know that we're at the end of time. I'm happy to stay on a little longer for anyone else who wants to continue the discussion. But for those who have to, you know, hop off, um, I think we can wrap it up if, and Joss, you wanted to kind of say a sentence or two, um, kind of bringing everything together. And then also over here, we would love to get um, your feedback. Um, But yeah, I'll just kind of want to show you the full board (laughs) um, before people drop. Um, If Joss, you wanted to kind of yeah it's just, everything just referring together. Yeah. to Gahad's um, question there about the bigger picture of uh, what's what's going on here and it's that, mm-hmm. that model of the system um, that hopefully you're familiar with set of elements that are interrelated interdependent in some overall system that performs a function within an environment and that that applies to a school it applies to an ecosystem it also applies to all sorts of organizations and we're trying to figure out how do the bits and pieces we know about organizations fit into this bigger idea of a system or an organization is a complex adaptive yeah. system? And uh, mm-hmm. what are those macro categories and how can this help us yeah, see that bigger picture and then potentially how they fit yeah. together and you know all the ideas and methods and everything out there, how might they you know fit into this um, broader, broader framework is mm-hmm. the idea here. Uh, yeah. And just a first iteration, right? We just started this about two months ago. And it's great to get your feedback. Thank you very much for contributing. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Joss. And thank you all for your time today. Here we have um, some links to join our hub page. This is where we kind of have most of our communication, kind of show what we're working on, um, can engage in dialogue, workshops like these, but also more casual, you know, open discussions um, are some of the things that we hold. Uh, we have the YouTube site for the recordings that we have for um, our other workshops and events, learning series as well. LinkedIn has more general updates. And over here, we would love to get your feedback. This, you know, highly informs, <laughs> you know, what we do and like how we do it. So you can just kind of pull a sticky note from the side and to answer these questions. So we're gonna have to move these to the front. Okay, it was not locked down. Um, <laughs> so here you can just kind of um, move these along side the scale depending on how much you agree and then kind of leave like a little note um inside for further context but yeah i'll leave you guys to you know click on the links and add feedback but um 
I know that the session was really quick, so I'm also happy to stay on and, you know, talk for another, you know, 15 minutes or so if someone had something to share that they didn't get to or have any other thoughts um, that they have.